I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, more, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, Thank good you. and the beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like, you know, grassroots neighborhood organizations, a lot of these were sponsored by the church. What does it mean to say that the Christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there? Um, you're always uh, being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects. Welcome to The Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm Dean Detloff, and I am your favorite DNC special guest, musical guest, this week. Which one? What special musical guest are you? I'm, I'm the special one. There's a lot of musical oh. guests, but I'm the special one. That makes sense. Hi, I'm Matt Bernico. I'm on this podcast. I'm coming at you live from the DNC this week. Um, here with the the special musical guest, Dean. Hey, uh, <laughs> hey, Matt. Um, it's great to see you as always at these kind of events. Um, yeah, glad glad that you're reporting from the ground here at the DNC. <laughs> Usually, they have the person doing the interview kind of start the conversation, but what we're doing is some avant garde journalism where I'm gonna, uh, <laughs> I'm going to let you do it. So there we go. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, as the special musical guest. I'm more curious about um, your own sort of uh, experience of this whole this whole convention. Uh, it seems I, the interviewer, has become the interviewee. <laughs> I wrote a song about it later. It's no big deal. Um, <laughs> everybody is talking about the 2020 DNC this week. And don't worry, we're not going to do it. Despite this extremely impromptu, very bad sketch, we're not talking about the DNC at all. Um, it did make us think about some things, though, like the relationship between political parties and social movements and what it could mean to even talk about socialism right now in the United States. Things are pretty bleak. Uh, but we got to think about it. So lately, both Matt and I have been reading up on some work by a Chilean political thinker named Marta Harnecker, who just died last year, unfortunately. Um, she had a long life. <laughs> she was a, a Catholic activist when she was young and eventually went on to study with the French communist philosopher Louis Althusser, who we've talked about on the show before. Um, she was also attentive to liberation theology and just a very creative kind of political thinker and theorist, someone who was uh, not just like writing books, but also really observing what was happening in a, a meaningful kind of way. Yeah, totally. Harnaker is a really fascinating person. She's not just a theorist, but she's also uh, a real partner and collaborator to socialist experiments across Latin America. She was responsible for disseminating a lot of Marxist ideas and Leninist literature across the region, which is cool. And she was also involved in Allende's government. Uh, she fled to Cuba after the coup of Allende. You might have heard about that. Um, <laughs> and later she was an advisor to Hugo Chavez. And uh, she was really involved in the development of participatory democracy in Venezuela, which would end up uh, influencing lots of communist and socialist projects all over the world. And it's a very exciting thing to me. Um, she, yeah, even influenced uh, Maduro. So she's kind of in the thick of it as a political advisor. Um, if you're new to this podcast, you might think, hey, that's a weird thing that people are talking about Venezuela positively. <laughs> if that's the case, welcome to this podcast. First of all, thank you for listening. <laughs> uh, you should also check out some of the, our past episodes, specifically episode 31 with George Chikoro Mar. And also episode 98 with Jim Hodgson when we talk about uh, Venezuela specifically. And you can get some more context on like what's going on there outside of the lamestream media. <laughs> yeah, I think what's really interesting about Harnecker's um, work is her ability to really think through like what's happening in socialism in the 21st century. Kind of beyond the usual tropes of repeating uh, like Leninist lines or something else. Um, so, you know. With everyone talking about politics this week, we read two of our articles in the monthly review, one that's called 21st Century Socialism and one that's called Social Movements and Progressive Governments. And uh, I think that she has a lot to teach us. So uh, 
let's get into it, Dean. Let's get into it, indeed. Yeah, um, I should say, too, these, uh, some of her essays at the Monthly Review are collected in a, um, lots of books, but a particular one, her last book, which is called A World to Build, um, from 2015, and uh, it, it collects sort of expanded versions. One of them is the um, Social Movements uh, essay. Anyway, if you want more Harnaker, it's a very good book. Um, but why don't we start out talking about 21st Century Socialism, um, that term itself has a, an interesting genealogy. Um, maybe we could talk about that more in a moment. But uh, the the, re, the real key here, maybe to get us started, is that it is in distinction from 20th century socialism, which is not only a temporal distinction, not just being like, how do we do this now, but also a certain political and ideological distinction too, which is to say we're not doing it like they necessarily did it, you know, in the last century. So, Matt, um, what's the deal with 21st century socialism? Can you lead us in to what Honaker has to say about it? Yeah, I'll lead us in by way of reading something that Marta Harnaker has written. <laughs> Great. <perfect. laughs> I'm not going to tell you what it is. Someone else is going to do it. That's all right. All right. So uh, Marta Harnaker opens her essay on 21st century socialism like this. Why talk of socialism, we may ask. After all, socialism had such negative connotations since its collapse in the Soviet Union and other Eastern European countries. For many years after Soviet socialism disappeared, intellectuals and progressive forces talked more of what socialism must not be than of the model that we actually wanted to build. Some of the facets of Soviet socialism that were rejected, and rightly so, were statism, state capitalism, totalitarianism, bureaucratic central planning, the kind of collectivism that seeks to homogenize without respecting differences, productivism, which stresses the growth of productive forces with, uh, without being concerned about the need to protect nature, dogmatism, atheism, and the need for a single party to lead the transition process. So these are all the things that Marta Harnaker thinks are uh, particular types of failures of the socialism of the 20th, 20th century. Um, so then she asks again, so like, why talk about socialism if there are all these problems? And uh, I'm going to paraphrase a lot here, <laughs> but <laughs> basically, uh, why I speak of socialism? Because capitalism is a deathly problem to people. And <laughs> that is why. Uh, socialism, because uh, we have to do something about capitalism and socialism is that thing to do. Um, so yeah, she, she, um, I, okay, first of all, let me say this as kind of like a, a quick side note. Um, I've read a lot of like left communist literature in my lifetime where people go on and on about all these problems with the Soviet Union and that type of socialism. But uh, Harnaker, who is, you know, a person involved in an actual socialist government doing it, I guess hits a little bit differently for me than, you know, Hart and Negri or somebody. <laughs> um, you know, she has, I guess, a little bit more credibility than some like uh, academic, I guess. But anyways, um, yeah, I mean, I think these are it, it's socialism is no good without self-criticism. Um, and I think that self-criticism around the topics that she mentions are necessary to kind of deal with and, you know. Um, if, if we don't want to do these things, or if these are things that we're kind of uh, leery of, then we ought to think about what we want to do instead. And that's what the project of 21st century socialism is kind of about. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and like you're saying, there's a, a big difference between Harnaker lob lofting, lobbing, making these critiques, than a number of other people, uh, left comms or, or others. Um, it's worth noting, too, that Harnaker spent a really great deal of time moving through the world of the old left, even defending it when it wasn't particularly popular. Um, and she developed and changed herself. So I feel even if one disagrees with her, um, it's important to sort of affirm that she's earned, I think, the right to be critical. You know, it's not like she's just repeating lines that she read on the internet or you know just discovered socialism as a teen and now she's upset about the soviet union <laughs> like <laughs> this is uh somebody who like we said earlier was responsible for disseminating marxist leninist literature across latin america so she knows what she's talking about um and you know perhaps there's more to say for sure and whatever i like leninism a lot I spent a lot of time with leninists and i'm into it but uh it's good to also kind of hear these more um complicated critiques and kind of hear them coming from uh, a place where people are trying to build socialism and quite frankly, doing a better job of it <laughs> than we're doing <laughs> here in Canada, or the United States. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's worth saying too, that like Marta Harnaker seems like she kind of likes Leninism too. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, that's she, right. She goes out of her way to, to always draw Lenin into the conversation. And like, it's not like, uh, 
in in giving the criticisms of the Soviet Union and other communist projects, she's not like dismissing them. She's yes, you know, I think trying to point out things that uh, we should learn about. So I don't think it's like uh, it's not it's not as bad as Leftcom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, well, it does lead her to say some things that will drive Leninus up the wall, but nevertheless, we should talk about them. Get ready, Leninus. Yeah, right. Um, a certain kind of Leninus. Uh, she says, uh, for instance, when one talks of socialism, one is talking of something quite different from what we are experiencing. We could give it a different name. If someone doesn't like the word socialism, they could call it communitarianism. If they don't like communitarianism, they can give it the name living well. That's no problem. We won't fight over names. Uh, okay. And I think this is a, a real, like, um, revealing sort of sensibility that you get in 21st century socialism, which is that we're just trying to, like, build the right thing. For someone like Harnaker, that obviously comes out of an explicit socialist tradition. But at the end of the day, if somebody just has to call it, like, the good government or whatever, uh, she's like, whatever, you you know, I'm not going to try to convince you that this is the, the right term to use, but I am going to convince you that this is the right path to take. Yeah, I think there's something good about that. You know, she she draws in, um, like you know, maybe you wouldn't use the word socialism because it would rub uh, religious people the wrong way, or because the indigenous people of the area already have a different word for some of the same practices uh, or similar ideas. So it's like you know, let people call it what they need to call it. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I think that's um, it's a good and flexible way to be. Yeah, that's right. Well, as always, uh, Harnaker gets a lot of inspiration from Hugo Chavez, who, uh, man, is a pretty fascinating character. I feel like the more I read about Chavez, it's just uh, the more I'm intrigued by him as a person, I guess you could say. Uh, and uh, Harnaker really sees him as a, a kind of luminary, I guess. She doesn't go as far as to call him like the Fidel of the 21st century, but I kind of get that impression. That's the 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 way that she talks about him um in some respects which is to say like a, a leading light of latin american socialism um right Bef before we get into talk about what she says about chavez do you want to say some things about chavez in case people don't know okay sure yeah uh that's right um hugo chavez was a um the first uh real elected socialist president of venezuela um, he was elected in the late 90s and uh, famously survived a coup that uh, he was cooed by the um, reactionary forces and then was uh, re-elected <laughs> through democratic means back into the presidency, which is just one of the funniest defeats of American imperialism in the whole world. Uh, so really, um, based on that event, also kind of shamed the United States in a, a very interesting way and, and was known as somebody who... Uh, was a person of the people in many respects. Uh, in fact, a lot of people in Venezuela refer to themselves as Chavistas rather than just a particular kind of socialist. Um, he's identified, maybe for better or for worse, as a, a left populist. Um, and he also, perhaps most famously and most importantly, tried to steer Venezuela in a direction toward real participatory democracy um, calling for constituent assemblies and changing the entire constitution and building entirely new uh, experiments in local forms of government that have real le legislative power and influence. Um, not somebody who was perfect, but certainly somebody who uh, completely changed the shape of the country where he lived. Um, I don't know what else there is to say. He, he originated in the military. That's kind of an interesting thing. Um, read a lot of weird Marxist literature while he was in the military and then when he became president, also retained a lot of respect to the armed forces in Venezuela, which is to this day, the, uh, the armed forces are still, um, defenders of the state, which is, you know, pretty bizarre <laughs> when you <laughs> think about how that usually goes in Latin America. Um, so anyway, uh, a really important character. He died not too long ago. I forget now the exact year, but, uh, um, Maduro is his, uh, appointed successor, um, still today. There we go. Okay. That's Hugo Chavez. Um, now here's what Marta Harnaker says about him. <laughs> we can say without a doubt that Chavez was the one who brought popular attention to the term 21st century socialism. And that in doing so, he brought to differentiate the new socialism from the errors and deviations of the socialist model implemented in the 20th century in the Soviet Union and Eastern European countries. Um, so, right. She lays out all of these, uh, these things earlier um, that she thinks are wrong with the, you know, the USSR. 
and um, other socialist projects in Eastern Europe. And then she says, uh, instead, like Chavez is about this sort of different, this different thing, this whole different type of socialism. So in Chavez's articulation of socialism, um, it pointed towards um, uh, the following things, says Marta Harnecker. Economic transformation, participative and protagonistic democracy in the political sphere, and socialist ethics based on love, solidarity, and equality before men and women and everybody. These social these socialist ideas and values are very old. They can be found, according to Chavez, in the biblical texts, in the gospel, and in the practices of our indigenous people. So there you go. <laughs> um, uh, before we were talking, Dean, or before we were recording, Dean and I were kind of remarking how interesting it is that like Chavez is a very good example of like uh, what democratic socialism can actually give you. Um, but a person who, at least in the United States, democratic socialists don't pay a lot of attention to, which is too bad. But here we go. We got someone who's elected democratically. He's a socialist. He's even, you know, got some of these good Christian ideas uh, kind of ruminating <laughs> in, his, in his mind about socialism. So so there's Chavez. Yeah, that's right. Um, and it's good to point out that uh, those sort of uh, touchstones, right, that you can find, find these socialist values in the Bible and in the practices of indigenous peoples, are all ways that uh, Chavez is inviting people to participate in the process in their own way, right? You can come to the process through your Bible study. You can come to it through your community, whatever it might be. Um, Chavez just wants to get you to the table, and you can all figure out how to really build a, a society that works for the people and not for the bourgeoisie. Um, and I think it's important to always sort of see that as the the lasting legacy of Chavez. And also the reason that even, you know, as Venezuela has been crisis ridden in the last many, many um, months now, years, uh, people have continued to vote for his party, even though he's gone, right? Because there's this kind of assumption that um, this is a people's project. Yeah, that's right. Um, the people, the people's project part of it, I think is really important. And um, unless you kind of read about, you know, the minutia of the political process in Venezuela, you might just miss out on altogether, right? Like no one's talking about it in the the U.S. news or whatever. <laughs> it's not on. Uh, it's on MSNBC. Um, yeah, part of the part of socialism in the 21st century that Marta Harnecker and Chavez thought were very important were this thing that um, Marta Harnecker. Maybe she. I don't know if she coins the term ex exactly, but she's the one that uses it a lot. And it is participatory planning. So uh, Harnecker thinks that socialism has to be like directly and radically democratic and participatory. Um, so she is uh, an advocate for it. She has she talks about it all the time, but she advocated for these types of policies. Uh, you know, with Chavez, she wrote this giant book about it. That's very interesting, called a decentralized participatory planning proposal, um, and it's like a textbook <laughs> uh, that she wrote. Uh, with his other uh, political scientist, but like it is basically teaching you like how to set up these like uh, participatory community structures <laughs> that can try to take care of um, you know political problems at the at the lowest level. Um, so when it comes to participatory planning, there's a ton that we can say about like how this all works. Uh, I've read 50 pages of this giant book, so I'm no <laughs> by no means an expert, but like. Um, the idea is that it it, it's, uh, it it kind of works off the the principle of subsidiarity. It's trying to create a structure where um, you know things can can be taken taken care of at the lowest level um, primarily, uh, and it's really interesting. So um, it's a process that uh, it was used in Venezuela, uh, and also a process that's being used in Kerala and other places too, uh, Kerala, India, that is, which we talked about on the. Uh, Patreon podcast last time around. But um, what's really cool about it, though, is like how meticulously democratic it is. Like for people in the United States, it would be very annoying. <laughs> It'd be like the most annoying process <laughs> because it's like um, in, in Venezuela, they kind of decided that the best way to kind of break people up into chunks is based on their geography and their communities. So, you know, they create these councils that people would um, be a part of to, you know, um, bring their bring their grievances, their problems, their ideas, and, you know, for, for institutional change in their communities. And um, basically, like, you have to have representatives from, like, you know, everywhere in this in this region, and they have to be so many there present to, you know, get, a, get the job done. All I'm trying to say here, this very complicated process, is that the whole 
uh, idea behind socialism from for Marta Harnacker is to be democratic and participatory. Like the people have to be there and be involved. There's not the sense of like, you know, there's a, a bureaucratic council at the top that's making these decisions and they're filtering downwards uh, for, for this um, articulation of socialism. It's uh, people at the bottom um, kind of organizing themselves, trying to take care of things where they can and then elevating their concerns to the state when they can't do it. And uh, boy, is that interesting. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that book, by the way, that you mentioned um, is really hilarious. Uh, If you like, so it's very big. It's very weirdly shaped, uh, first of all. So the the physicality of it is already kind of a a strange artifact. But uh, the book reads like um, almost like a management textbook, I feel like. Like, yeah, like if you were like going to business school, you would read books that were written like this. But it's like a book about how to create a revolutionary government using institutional means. And man, all I really want is like someone to do like a coup, a mayoral coup in a small town and use this book to figure out how to run a social society in that small town. It just, what I love about it is it testifies to Harnaker's ability to uh, go between not just theorizing, but also being like, people actually need to do this and they need to know how to do it. And here's how. And man, I wish I was that intelligent. <laughs> yeah, it's super smart. Um, I've done a little bit of reading on like organizational culture and like how um, institutions work from this like communications perspective. Um, and uh, what I love about it though is that it's just like such a well thought through system. Um, and uh, something that always sticks out to me from those kinds of studies is is um, these like long explanations of why hierarchies can be really problematic when they're overtaxed. Um, mm-hmm. Hierarchies that are overtaxed, that are really inefficient types of models of organization. But what we have here is like this whole different type of um, societal organization where like it doesn't work that way. <laughs> like mm-hmm. people have the direct means to kind of solve their own problems. And it, it's exactly right, though, if you did have a mayoral coup, right? Or even if you were like, uh, even if you were a, just a democratic socialist that got elected to the, be the mayor of a small town, as long as you had like the keys to the budget or someone who would work with right. you on it, you could totally do this. And I yeah. think that's what's, it's a, it's a really interesting uh, organizational model that is like scalable, that I think is right. pretty cool. Man, uh, something to nerd out about. If you like planning, <laughs> if you like organization, if you like uh, uh, big ideas about democracy, this book is extremely strange, but it's for you. Yeah, listen, it's like if you like theory, you're going to find some stuff in it, but you have to like charts. You've got to like budgets. You've got to like uh, <laughs> uh, day by day plans for how to build a playground in a week. That is the kind of thing <laughs> that you find in this wild textbook. Exactly. Yeah, it's pretty fantastic (laughs) there's like i was reading it the other day and there's this one um uh proposal for building a playground and it's so awesome because some of it's stuff that you would expect right it's like i don't know you got to build a budget you got to figure out where you're going to get the materials then you got to show up at the job site all that kind of stuff but there's like things that are like and make sure that you like bring some sandwiches because people do get hungry (laughs) it's like (laughs) really making sure that you uh cover all your bases and all of that yeah it's awesome it's the weirdest textbook that you didn't know you needed (laughs) um all right well uh let's move on a little bit from that unfortunately uh to talk about uh marta harnaker's other article that we read um social movements and progressive government so if chavez gives us a certain vision of 21st century socialism and if there's this kind of new paradigm where we're we're translating or transforming or trying to figure out what socialism could mean uh in a different kind of situation Marta Heidegger also wants to, again, not deal with just the ideals, but sort out what are the relationships that make something like that possible. And that's what she's doing here. So the big success of not only the Venezuelan project, but so many others, um, Eva Morales in uh, Bolivia uh, for a while, um, the governments of Ecuador, um, many, many others that you could mention, Argentina, briefly, uh, Brazil, of course. All these places that had left-wing governments or still have them um, dwindling, unfortunately, the success really relied on being able to mobilize social movements that were, in some cases, like the labor movement, but more often than not, um, other kinds of associative groups or associations. And Harnaker is really interested in how those groups mediate their concerns or interests with the the government itself, with the power, um, the state that's around. And man, she has a lot of great stuff to say. 
uh, we'll we'll break it down a bit. But I think um, I want to go back to something you were saying, Matt, about democratic socialism. You know, like you said, so many democratic socialists kind of don't think about Chavez or Venezuela or these other kind of experiments in Latin America um, for reasons I don't know, maybe because they think that they're poisonous because of um, how people talk about them or what. But uh, what I love about this is that it's a proposal for a certain kind of democratic socialism that shows mm -hmm. that it's maybe not a defunct idea, but it's also not reducible to like voting or entry of strategies or things like that. It's a much bigger kind of notion. And, you know, OK, I'm not throwing all DSA people under the bus or all democratic socialists under the bus. There are a lot of good ones who, who certainly do think in these more expansive terms, but uh, a lot of folks who don't do. So it's worth, worth just pulling out. So uh, let me start out like this. Um, here's something Harnaker says. The big challenge for these movements across Latin America uh, is to advance towards socialism when they have conquered only the government, a strategy that conflicts with the classic Marxist vision, which has traditionally insisted on the need to destroy the bourgeois state, as in the revolutions of the 20th century. Those revolutions, born from civil wars or imperialist wars, not only mastered but destroyed the inherited state apparatus. So it's understandable that some sectors of the left feel disoriented when they find themselves in such a different situation today. Thanks, Marta. I appreciate that pastoral line. Uh, <laughs> she goes on to say, uh, Furthermore, electoral success captures only a part of the state. Control of executive power often initially comes without control of the parliament or judiciary. In addition, other capitalist-dominated institutions like finance, mass media, or the military remain intact. The issue then is how to work toward conquering these other areas of power, winning more people to the transformative project, and ensuring that at every step the part they participate in building their own destiny. Uh, and let me just say one last thing, and then we'll pull it all together. She says, if revolutionary caters take over the existing state, they can use their power to begin building the foundations of the new institutions and political systems needed to replace the old state. Above all, they can build, they can begin creating spaces for popular protagonism, preparing people to exercise powers in all aspects of their lives. But history has shown that the heavens cannot be taken by storm, and that a protracted period is needed to travel from capitalism to the new society that we want to build. So those are some sectarian fighting words, and it's probably fair to hear them as such, <laughs> but yeah. uh, also very interesting words to hear. And uh, yeah, I mean... I, I've said a lot, I guess, just by reading this. So maybe I'll, I'll toss it over to you, Matt. Uh, what do you think about this kind of vision of a certain democratic socialism? Um, I mean, what sticks out to you in it? Oh, man. Well, there's, I think, something in each of these quotes you read that stick out to me. <laughs> Great. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Maybe let's, let's go step by step here. So mm -hmm. the big challenge for these movements is to advance towards socialism when they have conquered only the government. So I think that's really interesting. Um, so that's not the case of the United States and probably a foreign idea that the left would have in any way conquer the government. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, I think it's helpful, though. Um, you know, um, electoral strategies are good. Um, you might as well use them because it's it's a tool in the toolbox. Right. And, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, you'll have a big electoral win and, and maybe even like, you know, a lot of progressive people will get elected to one of the branches of the government. And mm -hmm. like, you know, that's that's already kind of happening in some cases. Uh, for example, Cory Bush, what's up? Um, <laughs> that happened in, in Missouri and I'm excited about it. Um, but whatever, right? E even if you do that, even if you manage to get people um, elected to the government, that's awesome and good and maybe would be helpful uh, strategically. But at the same time, like that's not the whole of the battle. There's a whole lot of other institutions that will kind of like learn how to fight back against you. Um, which, you know, when you have a country of a bunch of like with a bunch of billionaires and, uh, you know, there's such a strong like in the United States, at least there's a, a bunch of billionaires. and There's like a strong tradition of them like funding, like paying for governmental <laughs> uh, support or like paying for legislation, basically. Um, uh, you know, it, just winning the government is enough, isn't enough. So I appreciate that point. That's a great um, a great democratic socialist lesson to learn that. Uh, the democracy part has to be more than voting, I guess, right? Um, mm -hmm. More than just like getting somebody elected. Um, and I think that's good. And, and maybe you only have one one part of the government and, and you have to kind of figure out ways to win the others. Um, so there's that that's really good. And the other part that's really interesting too, though, is, um, well, it's going to be necessarily coalitional to kind of like win over those other 
organizations, but there's also the sense in which there's like a type of dual power logic going on mm-hmm. here, mm-hmm. Um, right? That there's a protracted period that needs to, uh, that, that we need to kind of have to travel from capitalism to a new society where we have to be building these other types of institutions that can be pr- protagonistic, which is a very interesting uh, word to use rather than antagonistic, which mm-hmm. I appreciate. <laughs> um, we're the good guys in this fight. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the the sense of dual power where you're build, you're bu- building these other institutions to challenge sort of the the parts of the government or the parts of the you know culture that you can't um, you can't seize immediately through an election or something. So man, um, I don't know. It seems like if you're a person who is, I, I mean, either a, a, you're a Marxist Leninist, uh, you're a communist of any type, or you're a democratic socialist. Like these are the things that you should probably hear. Um, mm-hmm. That you know. There, at the point even she's talking about you know latin america but i think it it applies in a lot of ways to the united states and kind of the ways forward for socialism here um i don't know what else can we talk about yeah well i mean um it's true it it, uh it means it's a certain democratic socialism that's coming out here that's really compelling i think whether you're again as you said a marxist leninist or some other kind of communist or socialist um you know, I think there is she she does spend time criticizing a certain kind of Leninism. But as we mentioned earlier, she has a lot of time for another kind. Um, one thing that I think is so fascinating, though, is uh, this um, this point about trying to work through the institutions of the state and really trying to figure out what exactly it is that you're inheriting and, and what you have to deal with in that sense. Um, we'll talk about that more in a minute. But uh, like this is also a problem that people faced in uh, communist revolutions where they did try to completely destroy or smash the state, you know, like uh, in um, early Soviet Russia, there's all kinds of problems because they like inherit all these kind of weird things, right? Civil servants are going on strike and to like protest the the revolution and they have to like figure out what to do about that. Right. <laughs> like um, nobody finally just like starts over on a uh, year zero the next day. There's all kinds of stuff that haunts you. Um, that's something that Marx warns himself about in Critique of the Gotha Program, right? That uh, there's going to be a lot of compromising that you have to slowly weed out over time. And Mm -hmm. in that sense, too, I think that Harnaker is presenting us with something that is still profoundly Marxist. Uh, That idea that you have to, as she puts it, travel from capitalism to the new society we want to build. Um, That is the thing that Marx thinks as well, although you need a certain revolutionary moment to get you there. Yeah, that's right. And um... For Harnaker, it's cool because like the revolutionary moment is like a very long moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The it's uh she uses the term uh, a protracted period and it's like a protracted people's war, but <laughs> by different means, you know? Yeah, yeah. So the the institutional one, not the uh not the grills in the jungle, which are fine too. Yeah, right. Um well let's talk about how the maybe the backdrop against which that revolution is um is put kind of makes all the difference. So she says in this essay that um, the situation in the 1980s and 90s in Latin America was comparable in some respects to the experience of pre-revolutionary Russia in the early 20th century. The destructive impact on Russia of the imperialist First World War and its horrors was paralleled in Latin America by neoliberalism and its horrors. Greater hunger and poverty, an increasingly unequal distribution of wealth, unemployment, the destruction of nature, and the erosion of sovereignty. Um, I really like this point for a number of reasons. Uh, First of all, I like it because it really zeroes in on how destructive neoliberalism is. Um, Mm -hmm. The analogy between neoliberalism and a world ravaged by total war, I think, is a fair one, a fair analogy. It's just, you know, the war looks different. It looks more polite under neoliberalism, but it's not. Uh, The other, though, is that by articulating the sameness, she also, uh, or the similarity, she also helps us understand the difference Right. Because uh, she's drawing a certain continuity between the Bolsheviks, what they're doing and what someone like Chavez is doing. But because the Bolsheviks are doing what they're doing against the backdrop of so much destruction in the First World War, uh, necessarily the Soviet Union ends up taking on different kinds of um, shapes. And uh, the the implication, it seems to me, is that that's what's happening in Venezuela, too, that uh, the experience of neoliberalism specific kind of destruction uh, creates material conditions that also end up leading to this really particular kind of uh, revolutionary answer. And I think it's useful to think that way always as a Marxist to sort of think about, okay, well, you know, 
just because the Russians did it this way or the people in China did it this way or people in Cuba did it this way doesn't necessarily mean that that's a sort of exportable model. Uh, the the Marxist science is not a, a list of like, you know, catechetical doctrines that you just sort of suck up and then hope for the best. Uh, it's right. a, a commitment to figuring out what's really going on such that you could actually do something about it. Right. And uh, what I find really helpful, too, is that it, it, defining it this way is like, you know, like what kind of state are people in Venezuela inheriting, you know, when, when mm-hmm. they when Chavez has power, right. And he's elected, like what kind of things do then they have to, how does that define the struggle that they're going to have? Right. Like, especially along, along the lines of neoliberalism, like the state can only do so much and it has to kind of deal with the, um, you know, the extract, all the extractive tendencies of like foreign powers who are in, in your state that you should, you know, you now, now you're seizing and, and kind of like on the path towards socialism. Now you have to deal with all these people like these, you know, imperialists who are there trying to exploit you know, your natural resources and your people. So that kind of determines, you know, the, the strength of your state is different is what I'm trying to say, you know, like mm-hmm, seizing the mm-hmm. state isn't enough and you have to do a whole bunch of other things too alongside of that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, it would be very, very difficult to think about this in the context of the U.S. or Canada, but it's also very important to do that, um, you know, to think about, well, what is the nature of the state now such that if you caught a part of it, you could do something mm-hmm. with it. Um, but I appreciate about the Communist Party of Canada to bring the Marxist on his voice in here, I guess, is uh, <laughs> that is exactly what they're trying to sort out, right? Like what what are the possibilities, but also the limitations present in the Canadian state as it exists and uh, as it could possibly exist? And what I think is really underrated about the platform of the Canadian uh, Communist Party is that they advocate for a people's government that is a coalitional government, something that brings together all kinds of sectors of society and doesn't propose this 100% exactly, but also doesn't not propose it (laughs) exactly either. Uh, And I think it's because um, it recognizes the platform does um, or the program does what Harnaker is saying, which is that, you know, the revolutionary conditions that could someday be met in Canada are probably not the same, um, at least for the foreseeable future as they would have been in whatever um, czarist war stricken Russia. And uh, again, it just testifies maybe to that continuity of Marxism's uh, focus on trying to sort out what's really going on. Yeah, totally. The, um, the terms of struggle are always dictated by the material conditions, not like a formula. Yeah. Um, well, okay. You see the state, you, you did it. You've, Man, it's hard to say those words. <clears throat> You've seized the state. You did it. You got a part of it. You got a piece of it. And you're putting it all together. Um, things do not go super well uh, at every turn, precisely because of all those contradictions, right? And uh, what I love about Marta Harnaker, she's very open and honest about that. And she also tries to figure out what that means for building um, socialism, so, you know, one criticism people often make of Venezuela's model is that because they only have parts of society, it's still not, you know, despite what we hear in the news, it's not an authoritarian state. Um, in some ways, people wish that, you know, people on the left sometimes wish it was more authoritarian so that it could do things like um, just expropriate this or that factory or something. Uh, perhaps they should, you know, who, who could say? But uh, because they don't, and because there is some differentiation within society, there are all kinds of different interests that compete with one another and fight with each other. And that can also mean certain retreats or defeats, even as you're advancing along the revolutionary path. And as you can imagine, that is uh, the kind of thing that can make it difficult to continue having popular support behind. If people feel like they're just getting screwed or um, the government isn't up to deal with this task, then maybe they won't join on board. And uh, that's where Marta Harnaker introduces this term that I think is just really fantastic and useful, which is the pedagogy of limitations. So let me read about that a bit and we can talk about it. She says, it's not easy to resolve the contradiction between political tempos and democratic processes. I love that phrasing. Very good. Political tempos. Prolonged discussions of law and procedure can unnecessarily endanger the future of the transformative process, as in Venezuela and Ecuador, she says. Thus, just as revolutionary leaders must use the state apparatus to alter forces they inherit and build new institutions, they must also sponsor popular education in the limits or obstacles in their path, 
what I call a pedagogy of limitations. It's often thought that talking frankly to the people about such difficulties will discourage and demotivate them, but in fact it helps them to understand better the process underway and to moderate their demands, without, however, renouncing their socialist goals. To ensure that these messages are communicated, the pedagogy of limitations must be accompanied by the promotion of popular mobilization and creativity. And it must be acknowledged that there's been a tendency on the left to think of popular organizations as manipulable, mere conveyor belts for the party or government line. Um, I really like this sort of point, at least, that uh, we need to have this pedagogy of limitations. Um, and I like it in a socialist register because I think in liberalism, you know, the United States is basically just a pedagogy of limitations in like <laughs> the worst possible way, right? I mean, we're seeing that with the DNC right now. Um, it's just speech after speech about like what's possible and what's not. And if you get upset at all, someone will be like, well, what do you expect? Joe Biden's just going to create socialized medicine. And if you say yes, people look at you like you're out of your mind. <laughs> um, so I think there's a difference between the liberal pedagogy limitations and what Harnecker is saying, which in a socialist society, it's kind of ironic because you have to like retrain your brain to assume that the government is working on a good path. Uh, and nevertheless, um, within that, you have to sort of find some way to trust that uh, when the government says it's having a hard time with this or that thing, you're like, all right, it probably is. And like, I hope they can figure it out. Maybe I can help them sort it out because it's a people's government after all. And that's like a wildly optimistic thing to think. Um, it feels hard for me to imagine as a person with U.S. citizenship, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> very cool uh, anyway, and a good sort of realistic um, acknowledgement. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's hard to imagine in regard to the government, for sure. <laughs> it takes a lot of stretch in my brain. But like institutionally, I think these types of things come up quite a bit. Um, you know, it's always the case. Well, OK, here's here's an example. Um, so in the labor movement, uh, what do people want? Higher wages because like getting paid more is awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's good, right? But um, when it comes to talking about higher wages, um, people get like kind of bent out of shape about demands. Um, like you know, uh, should the minimum wage be fifteen dollars an hour? People will always be like, "Well, no, it should be twenty-two dollars an hour." But like, really, I mean, shouldn't the workers just seize the means of production altogether? <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. But like in, there's a certain sense in which like, um, uh, you know, like you you have to work within the you have to work within the limitations that are set up politically. And like, you know, how do you do that with people who are like actively fighting for a, a better job situation for themselves without discouraging them, you know, altogether saying, like, well, all, all we can do right now is like all we can do right now is like $15 minimum wage. It's like in the president's um, it, it, it's in Joe Biden's. Um, you know, plan or whatever. <laughs> uh, I guess all I'm trying to say is that like these pedagogies of limitations are bigger than the government. They're also like within institutions that, you know, we have to work in and between when it comes to like building movements uh, towards socialism and whatnot. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's a helpful idea that kind of helps you think around like the shortcomings of institutions that do exist and like how you can negotiate like revolutionary energies and like demands, but in those in those institutions even if they don't have like the power of the full state mm -hmm. yeah i think that's right um it is there's nothing more frustrating on the internet uh than making a, a comment about something and having someone try to out left you i mean like uh right. aha you you think the minimum wage should be 15 dollars? i think it should be 30 dollars. and then someone's like Oh, you think it should be thirty dollars? I think we should abolish the value form. It's like, okay, <laughs> yeah, sure, whatever. But like, we're talking about tomorrow, <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, right. We're talking about like six months from now, uh, and I think uh, it's important that uh, people on the left understand the actual context and horizon that they're working with, and not sort of make up. I don't know whatever they want to think because they read a good book or essay about it. Yeah, I mean, like, um, yeah. D demand the impossible for sure but like realize <laughs> that there are so many only so many possibilities yeah yeah um well okay so uh you seize the state you've done the pedagogy of limitations um people are like all right i get it there's some problems but nevertheless we need to solve some of these problems how are you going to do it once again marta henniker she's there she's thought of everything and uh she says uh when it comes to national dialogue 
And she's talking about like big questions, like what should we do about extractive industries or something? She says, I would like to quote the words of Pope Francis. Um, you uh, religious left air horns. <laughs> uh, Pope Francis, who, when referring to this matter during his visit to Paraguay, said this kind of dialogue cannot be, quote, a theatrical dialogue in which we play out the conversation, but we only listen to ourselves. Dialogue presupposes and demands that we seek a culture of encounter, which acknowledges that diversity is not only good, it's necessary. Uniformity nullifies us. It makes us robots. The richness of life is in diversity, and for this reason, the point of departure cannot be, I'm going to dialogue, but he's wrong. If I presume that the other person is wrong, it's better to go home and not dialogue. Would you not agree? Dialogue is not about negotiating. Negotiating is trying to get your own slice of the cake. To see if I can get my own way. If you go with this intention, don't dialogue, don't waste your time. Dialogue is about seeking the common good. Discuss, think, and discover together a better solution for everybody. By trying to understand the thinking of others, their experiences, their hopes, we can see more clearly our shared aspirations. Uh, I love that Harnaker quotes this extremely Pope Francis thing to say <laughs> because um, she brings it into a real conversation. And uh, contextually, she also says, uh, like, if you're on the right side of um, really being for the people and in the interest of the people, then you're not going to approach a situation with like fear or feeling like you're going to get bowled over by some, you know, hidden reactionary thing or whatever. Um, if you really are able to dialogue with, let's say, uh, I don't know, a people's movement that's upset with you, like, um, well, we could pick some actual uh, examples, right? Like indigenous movements in Venezuela that are upset about extraction or, uh, I don't know, um, certain civil society organizations like women's groups in Venezuela that are upset about particular um, cultures within Venezuela, uh, machismo culture, etc. These kinds of um, organizations are, you know, they're acting in their own interest. And what Harnaker is saying is uh, dialogue with the state is exactly trying to bring in that interest and figure out, okay, is there a way that we can hear what we need to hear that we haven't quite heard? And what can we do about it? Obviously, that doesn't always work. It's not the case that Venezuela has always done that or modeled that in every single way. But I think that actually there's some pretty fascinating ways in which it does try to cultivate that, um, certainly much more than in the United States, right? Like the Black Lives Matter movement is out there uh, really upset because there's no such thing as dialogue in the U.S. in terms of politics. And mm -hmm. that's like a pretty profound difference, I think. Yeah, I think it's a very profound difference. Uh, when you're reading this, I was thinking just like how difficult it is to talk to people who don't even kind of agree with you. <laughs> just because mm -hmm. like, you know, in uh, United States politics, people don't even like agree on terms. They don't even agree on the same reality. It's very difficult right now <laughs> to dialogue. Yeah. We just need to get back to dialoguing. Pope Francis, <laughs> come, come and help us. Um, I mean, sometimes dialogue doesn't work and you have to use other types of power, though, I guess. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And Harnaker would think so, too, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, what I think is so fascinating about this is that you can actually find some examples of Pope Francis trying to mediate, or at least the Vatican trying to mediate uh, through dialogue some disputes between Maduro and the opposition in Venezuela. Uh, not successfully, obviously, because the opposition is boycotting the upcoming elections even now. But um, it's really fascinating because like Maduro has uh, appealed to Pope Francis a couple of times since he got reelected, uh, asking the Pope to please come do some more dialogue. And Pope Francis is like, I'm totally done to do dialogue, but I have to like have a guarantee that everybody is going to come to the table and they are going to hear everybody out and they're actually going to do it. And it was like a pretty stern sort of warning to Maduro, uh, but also, you know, not not to uh, sort of suggest that Maduro is the only one holding up the process. Just uh, Pope right. Francis is being like, you ask. So here's the deal. <laughs> um, and uh, I really like that, actually. Right. That uh, there is this kind of interesting confluence of Pope Francis's real ideas about dialogue and how Venezuela is trying to sort through its own crisis. Mm -hmm. Man, I think that's such a cool thing. <laughs> like um there's i think that it'll be a minute before uh francis gets over to venezuela again <laughs> um but what a cool thing uh to do uh, as a pope you know um, yeah uh actually facilitating or like being there at least to facilitate dialogue given that people are willing to talk to one another and act on <laughs> the actionable things of the dialogue i mean you know it uh i don't really know i i 
I don't really know what Minoru would do in that situation. I mean, he's asking for the Pope to come, so apparently it's in good faith. I don't know, maybe not. But you know, it's not like Guaido is a uh, Guaido. This guy that's like backed by <laughs> the U.S. and Canada is gonna be like, yeah, I guess the Pope's right. I guess I should just back off and uh, yeah, right, and go do something different. It's right. not gonna happen. Yeah, there's a kind of like political naivete in both the Pope's vision, but also Harnaker's quoting of it that I kind of appreciate because again, it's just like, well, let's be honest, you know. And uh, Harnaker is sort of throwing down the question of whether or not people are willing to be honest. And obviously, when people aren't, you have to deal with that problem. But it's a, a nice sort of thought. Right. And I think, like, I mean, I don't want to read too much in the situation because I don't really know. But it's also the case, too, that I'm sure that Pope Francis doesn't want to be used sort of in a political totally. way. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's not like he wants to show up on the behalf of Maduro and, like, force the other guy to the table. So Maduro seems like he's on the side of the Pope or whatever. Right. But I think, uh, is Maduro Catholic? I don't even know. He is kind of Catholic. I mean, yes, he is Catholic, but he uh, has some other spiritual sort of traditions feeding into his own spiritual life. Yeah, I mean, all I know is that uh, from following him on Twitter, I know he's he's a Christian. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, he is a Catholic for sure. Um, I shouldn't qualify okay. it. I should say he's a Catholic um, who also dabbles in some other stuff. And that's great. Oh, that's cool. Like, whatever. Yeah. All right. Um, well, let's talk a little bit as we close about uh, some Marxist Leninist tendencies that can be kind of ugly, um, but are important to chat about, especially in house. Um, you know, like I said earlier, I spend most of my time with Leninists. I, I think myself as a Leninist. <laughs> I'm, I'm reading this essay as a person who is participating in all of that and trying to see what I can get out of it. And uh, man, Harnaker also has spent a lot of time around Leninists. And let me tell you, she does have her number on this one. So uh, she um, is talking about how there's obviously reactionary attacks on the government, but she says, unfortunately, progressive governments are often compelled to defend themselves, not only from elite obstructionism, but also from parts of the left who, failing to understand the complexity of the process and opposed to any tactical flexibility, attack them for not achieving profound social changes fast enough, carrying them as if they and not the elite were the main enemy. Um I think that last part is really the key that uh, mm-hmm. who is the main enemy. Um, you might have sort of sub enemies and that's fine, right? Like we, it's not a call to obliterate all sectarian difference or something. Um, but I think it's uh, a recognition that um, in the long march towards socialism uh, to sort of monopolize or, or use a situation where a progressive government isn't getting as far as you wish that they did uh, to use that situation as a way of being like, and that's why we're the true, authentic, sort of very mm-hmm. left party, uh, is really unfair and totally unproductive. And it's something that you see all the time in uh, socialist sort of circles. Um, you know, there's gradations of it. Uh, I, I have a lot of time for being very critical of all kinds of socialists like Bernie Sanders and the rest of them. But uh, at the same time, and you, and you should make those criticisms, I think. Um, not saying you shouldn't. But, like, Bernie Sanders, thankfully, is not the main enemy either, right? Uh, and couldn't even pull it off in the end. So, uh, <laughs> somebody to be uh, critical of, for sure, no doubt. But, like, also, uh, in the event that Bernie Sanders became the president of the United States and actually got us moving in a direction, you'd have to figure out, okay, how can we push that even further? How can we be protagonistic with respect to the revolutionary process um, and turn it into one that actually is real? Not that Bernie Sanders would have inaugurated a real revolution, but just theoretically if he did right <laughs> well, i mean if he if he did we would have a radically different reading of this uh how to work with progressive governments text right <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> well okay <laughs> it might it might be a little bit more poignant uh That's I mean, it, maybe it would make more sense to us <laughs> yeah i i think it's good uh a good note um i don't know like uh I have no time for people trying to outleft other people. Just like you said earlier, I think that's really frustrating. Um, like, I don't know people who think that like, you know, it, only their, only their iteration of a, of a weird sectarian Vanguard party is going to lead to the revolution. And like, you have to do it this one particular way. I feel like very frustrated about, I mean, I don't, I think that there is, uh, I, I think it's great to be in a communist organization. I think it's great to be in a socialist organization like do it be in a vanguard party for sure but i guess don't think that like you hold the keys to to getting to socialism or something right because yeah. uh you, you don't it's going to take a lot more than just you 
you know, I mean, like for all of their faults, uh, CPUSA is very good about some of these things uh, about not mm. outlefting people. <laughs> sometimes they're sometimes they're too good about it and they're too excited <laughs> about about voting for <laughs> for liberals, but that's okay. Um, uh, they're at least not like um, they're not pretending like this isn't like a coalitional movement or something. That socialism mm. doesn't require a lot of people, right? They don't they don't have any um, misgivings about that. They I think know. Uh, that uh, that it's going to take like a mass movement of people that aren't just like um, a very small like Marxist Leninist vanguard sect. It's going to take a lot of interconnection between ongoing movements that are different um, and need to dialogue with one another for sure mm-hmm. to kind of get anything towards socialism. Yeah, it's worth pointing out too. Um, like you said, you know, if if Bernie Sanders had won, we'd be reading this essay very differently. Um, it's worth noting that uh, Harnaker is not thinking about what to do about the Democrats or what to do about the United States government or what to do about Joe Biden. Um, you know, surely she understands those are uh, reactionary powers. Um, they're not the idea of the progressive government that she has, right? Um, right. Chavez's progressive government is a, a thousand light years ahead of anything that Biden would give us. Um, so important not to conflate those kinds of things. So I'm not saying that uh, all of her sort of suggestions are just like easily transferable to where we are or anything like that. Um, and in light of that, I think uh, we should just sort of end the episode talking about the uh, the way that she ends this article, um, yeah. which is, yeah, with a bunch of a, a list of great questions about whether or not we're advancing or retreating in the struggle. Yeah. So just like you said, Dean, like this is not about the United States, like she's not writing about the United States. Just the same. I think the questions that she kind of drums up at the end are really helpful for, um, yeah, I mean, for the, I, I guess, uh, think about it this way. Like, people are, are talking about, like, well, how are we going to pull Joe Biden to the left or whatever? And it's like, well, you're probably not. But, <laughs> um, but you know, there are other more progressive people who have just been elected and who will continue to be elected. So, like, uh, she offers some questions I think are really helpful for our own sort of self-criticism of the left to figure out exactly what's happening. So, here, let me read a few. Um, So, when it comes to, like, progressive politicians, here are some things to think about. Uh, Some questions to ask. Do they strengthen the working class? Do they eliminate subcontracting, create a universal social security system, bolster the unions, and facilitate workers' education and professional development? It's a great question. (laughs) It's it's one that's also easily (laughs) answerable. (laughs) Um, Have they hired a bunch of union busters on their staff is a great question. Um, Do they respect the autonomy of social organizations and trade unions? Hmm. Do they understand the need for an organized, politicized people able to exercise the pressure needed to weaken the inherited state apparatus and thus drive the proposed process of transformation? Not too many people that are going to be elected in the United States are going to be doing that one, but (laughs) it's a great question to still ask. Um, do they listen to the people and let them speak? Do they understand that they can only rely on the, or they can rely only on the people to fight the errors and overcome barriers that are encountered along the way? Do they give people resources and call on them to exercise social control over transformation? I think these are great questions, even though they like I mean, they don't fit our situation. But I think like as as people get elected, as as uh, institutions are developed. As we uh, experiment with new progressive uh, types of coalitions, I think these are questions that you can kind of come back to um, to interrogate those formations and see, like, are they really doing what we want them to do? Yeah, and it's important to sort of say that this helps us see that Harnaker isn't advocating for, like, a non-critical relationship even to progressive governments, but... Um, she's trying to offer these questions in such a way that you can sort of ask, are we moving along these paths or are we not? You know, maybe we haven't fully achieved it, mm-hmm. but is that where, where we're headed? And I think just asking that as a kind of horizon question um, helps to dissipate certain really bad sectarian energies and also helps to, again, sort of um, put more emphasis on being the, the protagonist, as she says, of socialism rather than being the the antagonist. I think that is like the hardest thing for me to get my mind around because when you live in, you know, the belly of the beast, um, antagonism is kind of what you what you have to, to do. It's what you learn to do. Um, but it's also like if you're ever going to build any kind of different sort of thing, you have to learn how to be a protagonist. You have to learn to be nice and like cast a vision yeah. that people can get behind and see themselves in. And man, what a spiritual discipline that I have not <laughs> yet learned. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Well. 
Um, here's my official review. Marta Harnicker. She's good. <laughs> yep. Uh, she's got the Magnificast stamp of approval. Marta Harnicker. Um, she's going to say things that challenge you. She'll say things that open up socialism for you. Uh, she'll just be a, a really productive interlocutor, you might say. Uh, and uh, as always, I, I feel like on this podcast, I, I just jump at the chance to say the monthly review is very good. And uh, the monthly review is a socialist magazine and a publisher, and they published these articles, but they've also published a few of her books, including that uh, bizarre democratic uh, planning uh, proposal. So if you want to learn about charts, um, you can go there and find out more. It's not, it's not bizarre. I just didn't ex- exactly expect that I was buying a textbook. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is bizarre, though. It's a, it, it, like, it's great. I love it. I, I, but like, what a strange book to exist in the world. Yeah, <laughs> I guess. Like socialist organizational management is uh, not the master's level class that uh, I knew you could take. But man, now I found out that there's a book that you could use to teach it. That's right. Um, I, I mean, God knows we need it. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Magnificast. If you like what you heard, you can support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash the Magnificast. Um, Go to monthly review. Get a monthly review subscription. It's not even that much, and it's very good. And uh, you can learn about all kinds of things, like Marxism and racial capitalism. That was the issue from this last month. And value chains, I guess. I don't know. That's what Dean was telling me about last night. It was great. Um, cool. If you, uh, As always, um, our music is by Amari Armstrong. Our outro music is by The Illogical Spoon. And we'll be back next week with more of the same <laughs> see you then church will meet down by the riverside there we'll swim with all creation never get tired never bored don't worry someday there'll be no damn between us and our lord jackson keep your hoods up you keep your hoods up and you stay up late Jackson, you keep your hoods up, well you keep your hoods up, and you stay up late, oh don't mind, a cold night, but we might mind if you leave too soon, so come on now, it's still early, at least I would have, what's you gonna do?